para esta conversación vamos a tener eh, a una invitada de lujo que nos acompaña desde eh, Reino Unido. Tendremos eh, la compañía de Lidia Bennett, cofundadora de la red de eh, World Mental Health. Eh, entonces, este, vamos a esperar que se una a la conversación y eh, el tema para esta sesión de Youth for SDGs es eh, respecto el día, el día global de salud mental. Hi. Hi, Lydia. How are you? I'm great, thank you. Sorry, it took me a minute to join. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you for joining. Uh, I really appreciate uh, your time. Uh, oh, yeah, I think I'm happy. Uh, your trouble. Your trouble. It's okay? Can yeah. you hear me okay? Yeah. I'm going to uh, use my... Uh, Earphones. No, okay. please tell me the Yeah, I see you. Okay, so right now let's start. Um, can everybody please uh, just if we are good, if the streaming is good? I don't think I don't think there's any difficulties. No. Yeah, it's it's all good on my end, so hopefully we're okay. Hopefully we're okay. Okay, great. So let's start uh, the conversation. 2020 and uh, the lemma for this uh, day or for this year is greater investment, greater access. So uh, thank you again, Lydia, for joining this conversation as a co-founder of this amazing network of uh, mental health. So uh, shall we start? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. We'll start with however, however you want to start. Um, I don't know if you have any yeah. questions or if you want me to talk a bit about how I feel about uh, World Mental Health Day or... Oh, I, uh, I think, uh, and I actually want to focus this conversation especially on the context. So this document has some really interesting topics and uh, the information it contains uh, is an easy lecture. I really recommend the lecture and we will share the information with everybody. So uh, I, I would love to hear uh, some introduction of the context of COVID-19 and mental yeah, health. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. So um, as you said, this year's theme for World Mental Health Day is um, greater investment, greater access, which I think is so important, um, especially under the context of COVID-19, because not only are we seeing a rapid increase in the need for mental health services um, currently, um, you know, for example, during the lockdowns, um, during quarantines, Um, people escaping domestic violence situations and that kind of thing. But um, I think something that everyone has really realized is that COVID-19 is going to have a very, very large long-term impact on mental health. And I think that's really why the theme this year is greater investment, because it's, it's all well and good. I think, um, you know, for example, small organizations stepping up and um, being there for people during quarantine, being there for people during lockdown and so on but what we really need is stronger mental health systems in the long term which requires greater investment um, and I think we've, we've so far been sort of placing a lot of pressure on small organizations, charities, um, o already overstretched national health services whereas you know I think the pressure really needs to be placed on governments now, um, and national bodies and international bodies to really invest in mental health treatment, mental health research, um, mental health education is also a really important thing that will be coming up. Um, and I think it's something that is often missed um, while we're, you know, we're advancing with stuff like addictions research and general mental health research. Stigma in, you know, in a ma the majority of countries, I'd say, is still a huge barrier to access to mental health care. So Um, all of these things really need to be invested in on a large scale, in my, in my opinion, and I'm sure the opinion of many people as well. 
Yeah, um, um, thoroughly. Uh, the world as we know it has changed dramatically, uh, dramatically because of the COVID-19 pandemic and lockdown. So uh, one of the topics of the highlights of this document is actually the way that we interact with each other and the uh, progress and long, uh, long-term consequences that we're going to face as a society, not only in adults, but in, in, young, in, in young people and children. So I think this is something we really need to consider because as the topics uh, of this document says, Uh, we need to have an investment and the right research information to take the right actions to uh, treat uh, all the uh, um, vulnerabilities derivated from this uh, pandemic, just like anxiety and uh, depression. Yeah, absolutely. And I think what's really important is to remember that something like this has not happened in any of our lifetimes, really, to the scale that it's happening now. You know, we've not lived under a pandemic before, neither have our parents and potentially neither have our grandparents. So it's really such an unknown quantity. And I think thinking, you know, it, it, it's quite sort of natural to think about the the long and short term effects of Um, COVID-19 on, for example, anxiety and, and depression, but we need to also think about the more long-term effects on, on issues such as OCD or, you know, the impact that being under lockdown has on those with addictions and, I guess, more nuanced areas of mental health that um, are less, you know, are less overt and are less publicly spoken about. Um, all of those things, I think, they can't be forgotten about um, and they really need to be to be focused on and um, researched into for us to be able to you know, put together mental health systems in the future that are very well responsive to, to pandemics such as this. Um, yeah. Yeah, and for these topics, uh, we developed some questions to uh, have a better um, context in the uh, conversation so um, um, sometimes in, from our personal experience we feel alone or we feel uh, uh, we are all affected by COVID-19 and the lockdown so I would like to if you could share some of your experience of your feelings and how you overcome them through this pandemic. Yeah definitely so I think um, you know everyone's experiences have been very different through lockdown. Um, for me, I was living with family, so it wasn't, it wasn't too isolating a situation, but I was, you know, I was thrown into a situation where I was living very, very closely um, with my family, which presents its own issues, as, as I'm sure, you know, many people can relate to. Um, but I think the, the biggest sort of issue for me, I guess, that I struggled with personally was having to just sort of be okay with doing nothing on the day to day. Um, and luckily for me, you know, I was, I, I'm about to start a new job. So I had something lined up for it, but for a lot of my friends and a lot of my family members, um, the lockdown really presented a time where, you know, no one was doing anything. No one was able to go out and get work experience or, you know, get a job and stuff like that. And I think activity really has an impact on people Um, people's happiness um, for me being um, I'm not you know I'm not a super productive person um, by any <laughs> means but I think having to sit at home and do nothing day after day was it was, it's, it's challenging for everyone I think it's especially challenging for like, for young people who you know our time is really valuable at this point you know we, we want to spend it learning we want to spend it getting experience to be able to go out and build our careers and it's just been such a big stumbling point for people um you know for me my university sort of shut down and went online and it it was just very different and very different to learn in that setting um which is a big shame because i think you know you you get to university level and you really want to learn um and that just wasn't that wasn't really possible so um It, yeah, it's difficult. It's It was really difficult for me, I think, the sort of lack of productivity. 
Uh, yeah, and um, I, I think it's uh, all the document and all that information that you're sharing it contributes uh, a little bit more to understand and uh, aware and, and the awareness of the global health. Day. And another topic of this uh, document is the value of mental health. Uh, how do we as people, as persons, value mental health and how do we express our feelings? And, uh, Uh, how do we express it, even with our own uh, family uh, circle or family friends? Yeah, I mean, I guess I guess it depends. It's different for everyone, isn't it? It's, it's so many factors play into that, the way we deal with our own mental health. I think, as I said, um, stigma is is a really big issue, and um, both self-inflicted stigma and I think um, you know stigma from family members or your community your friends so um, I think the first barrier that people you have to get over is self-inflicted stigma so you know not wanting to believe in yourself that that mental health is is a valid issue and something that's okay to have um, you know it's, it's okay to feel depressed or it's okay to have anxiety Um, being able to come to terms with that yourself is a really is a really big thing, um, but then to go and speak about it to other people, such as your family or your friends, is an even bigger hurdle. Which I think um, I think it's difficult, and I think everybody has their own personal experience with that. Everyone feels comfortable speaking to different people, whether it be your friends or your family. I mean, I'm sure your the way that you deal with you know with your personal problems is very different to the way I do but I think it's about finding finding the people you feel comfortable with and the people that you can trust um and you know just just speaking with them on a very very casual sort of level I think is important um, yeah not not trivializing mental health and not making it too uh clinical as well yeah with a mental disorder um well i mean it's a difficult question i'm i'm not an expert so i wouldn't want to give any sort of clinical or you know i wouldn't want to say that this is this is the how to guide on how to to to, to sort of approach somebody a friend or a family member who's experiencing a difficult period um but Through my own personal experience, I think maintaining contact is something really important. And I think from my own experience with mental health, I, whenever I have sort of periods where I'm feeling quite low, I tend to not want to talk to people or I don't want to go into details. Um, and I sort of try and, even if people are asking me, you know, you seem upset or you seem a bit down, like, talk to me, I'm here to talk to you. It's, it's almost... An impossible hurdle to do that when you're feeling low um, but I think what's really important and what I've really valued is the friends that they stick by you and even if you don't want to talk they keep talking you know they keep checking in with you they keep you know they don't get offended if you don't want to talk to them but they say you know I'm still here and a week later they say I'm still here you know then one day you do get to a point where you feel like actually um, I'm feeling like I can talk to you Um, that's that's something I find really important and I try and be there for, for my friends and my family members when I can tell that maybe you know they're not having a good time I just think it's important to make sure that they know that there's always somebody there whether they want to talk to them or not yeah and the next question will be uh, what is the role of the authority and the government in this topic and why does it matter <laughs> So that's a good question. I think, and that links in really well with the theme for World Mental Health Day this year, which is uh, greater investment, greater access. I think the role of authorities, um, I assume you mean like government bodies um, and international bodies as well, such as the WHO, um, various other you know, large organizations. But I think nationally, um, governments have a huge responsibility to take into consideration their population's mental health. I think that means not on the treatment level, not just making sure that there are more spaces in um, 
therapy groups, more spaces in um, psychiatric hospitals, you know, all those kind of clinical based things that are pre-existing. That's one side of the story. But I think governments also really need to start thinking about the ways that they can reach people outside of the clinical setting, for example, through community based um, organizations and through improved policy through improved education um that's the role that authorities have you know they need to be working on system level changes um looking at the way we teach mental health in schools looking at the way um elderly people are approached with mental health um issues you know there's there's such a mental health is such a huge field that i think is often especially in the eyes of the government is it's often seen as purely medicine, treatment, anything to do with, you know, mental health related drugs and stuff like that. It's, it's the sort of more holistic side to things is often forgotten about. And I think that's something that will really, it's really worth investing in, um, you know, community-based solutions to mental health issues. Um, there is, there is um, you know, can, can have a really big impact on communities, and I think is is often a low cost alternative that actually, if it was invested in better um, on a larger scale, would have a great impact. Yeah, and I also uh, want to share with everybody uh, the Global Mental Health Network. And it, I would love to uh, to know how do you how do you relate your daily activities with uh, Global Mental Health Awareness and uh, your uh, group and mental health. Um, so like you said, we have Global Mental Health Network, which is a network of, I think, over over 1,500 people now who are all interested in um, mental health in some way, um, be it that they are a mental health professional, such as a counsellor or a doctor or a psychiatrist, or working in um, research or working in policy or working in education. There's a huge range of people um, active on the Facebook group. And... Um, I guess it's it's a really great place to learn about like what sort of initiatives people are putting together, especially during the, the um, COVID pandemic. There have been some really interesting um, different organizations arise out of it and different initiatives um, from all over the world. And I think it's just really great um, for people from every every corner of the world to be able to come together in one um in one place and share what they're doing. Um, and a lot of a lot of the things that the people are doing on um, and sharing on the network are stuff like community-based mental health solutions in their in their very small communities in um, in their countries. And it's just it's so great to see um, during you know during this really difficult time. Um, it's great to see it every day people are sharing um sharing their work and sharing their experiences and it's it's really nice to see yeah and last but not but not least uh how do we um relate COVID-19 and inequality as a human right uh, to access a medical attention but also share the awareness of uh in the day of global mental health um yeah i feel like you know um about human rights and <laughs> the right to health and all that that entails especially in for example the sdgs so i mean i'd be interested to know what you think on that topic yeah, um, I'm actually right now trying not to talk a lot and just give it your question because people have, uh, comment that I have problems with the audio. So I think that we could, we want to, uh, yeah, so uh, they can hear you perfectly, but I can uh, be here well. So, so that's why I'm giving you the word for this whole session. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fine. I didn't want to to dominate the conversation. Um, but if, if no Don't one can worry. hear you, then that's fine. You're doing amazing. Um, <laughs> I'm glad. So yeah. So I mean, I remember our last conversation. We spoke a lot about um, the SDGs, and we spoke about the right to health. 
um, and the right to mental health um, treatment, the right to mental health support and so on. And, um, you know, that issue still remains that, um, that essentially mental health is not very present in, in the SDGs. Um, it's, it's there, but it's not very present. And I think what really needs to, to happen is um, for people who are actively involved in mental health policy, mental health research, mental health treatment, they really need to be at the table, at the decision-making table um, for really improving the way that mental health is represented in human rights and in, um, in the SDGs. Because the way I see it now is that um, mental health is sort of looked at as this, this one box trivial issue that can be dealt with through treatment. Whereas it's actually something that is omnipresent and it affects everything and it needs to be dealt with in a more I think a more diverse way um, through human rights because I, I do really think that uh, mental health is interwoven in, in so many other rights and, and so many other issues globally so for me I mean in an ideal world it would be great to see more representation at you know decision making tables from across the world because we have to remember that mental health um, is diverse you know mental health issues where you are in Mexico may be completely different to, to where I am or where some of my colleagues are um, in the world and we really need active representation from from all walks of life all different communities um, to to really understand what we need from you know a human right to mental health you know does that mean just treatment or does that mean education does that mean um you know for example access to to stuff like you know community-based self-help groups and and that kind of thing you know it's such it's it's not just a black and white mold um and it would be great to see see representation from all over the world um on that issue i suppose I could have done that, I just, could, just couldn't done it perfectly, you, you explained it perfectly. Thank you so much, Lydia, for your sharing this time with uh, the audience, for the interference, I don't know why, but um, I'll give you a question, and if you want to ask what can I do if I feel alone? Like, how do you deal with it? So, I caught the, the end of that. I think the question was, what do I do if I feel alone? Yeah. And, yeah. Um, yeah, so it's a good question because I think it's, it's difficult to answer because Realistically, you know, I would say if it was a question, if that question was coming from a friend or somebody that I knew, I would, I would point them towards the vast array of resources that we have available in the UK. And I would also talk to them as a friend. And I would, you know, I would reassure them and tell them that they're not alone. And I think that's something that's important to do is if you're feeling alone, is to reach out to whoever you can, you know, whoever you trust. Um, and I think trust is a really important thing because, um, often, you know, we have lots of friends, everybody has sort of big connections, big networks of connections. But amongst those, there'll only be a few people who you really trust, and you really want to know, you know, how you're feeling. So I think having just one or two people that you trust, and that you can go to and just say, look, this is how I'm feeling. And I, and I want you to know, because it might affect the way I act around you or it might affect um, my sociability and so on. So I think that's the first thing that's important to do is, is to reach out. And because I think no matter how lonely you feel, you're never alone. No one is ever alone in this world because it is, as everyone likes to say, it's a small world and everyone seems to have, you know, some connection in some way. And it's often somebody who you don't expect um, to be there for you. Um, so that's something to really hold on to, I think, even during your most difficult times is that um, wherever you are, you're not alone. And um, one thing that I would say is really important is social networks. So for example, online networks, 
Um, I think there are a huge variety of groups. Um, for example, I've just moved to a new city and there are, there are dozens of groups on Facebook for people like me who have just moved to a city and who are feeling lonely or that they don't have any connections in the city. And those groups are there for us all to come together on a mutual issue, which is that we're all new to a city and we're all feeling quite alone. So, um, yeah, I would definitely, I would definitely recommend using, using your sort of your social networks that may be online rather than your friend networks as well. Um, and, you know, lastly, there are plenty of resources. I know that people watching this may not all be from the UK or all be from Mexico or the US or wherever, but um, I think mental health and counseling and therapy and peer to peer based support is really growing um, globally. And I would say that wherever you are in the world, there is likely to be some kind of organization who is dedicated to being there for people who feel alone. Um, and it can be difficult to find those networks. Um, often you need to, you know, you need to search around a bit, but they are there. Um, and I think that that's a really good point of call for people who, who are feeling alone. Yeah, again, thank you for the time. Uh, amazing explanation of the context of Health Day. And I appreciate you. I hope we have a event where people can hear us better. We don't have to interfere from But again, Lydia, thank you for your time and for us to know what have shared with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to speak with you. See you till next time. Yes, until next time. I look forward to it. Ciao. All the best. Ciao. Bye.